The Tales of series is without a doubt one of the longest running RPG series out there and certainly one of the most successful long running action RPG series. In saying that however, it's never quite hit the same mass appeal or success as other genre godfathers Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. It was sometime between 2002 and 2004 I first discovered the series myself. Having checked out all the PS1 entries we received in North America, an emulated fan translation of Tales of Fantasia, and the seminal Tales of Symphonia all within a short period of time. At this time I can no longer recall which entry exactly was my introduction, but I can say with certainty Symphonia was my first obsession with the series and one of the games I've most replayed to this day. It's also what ultimately set the Tales of franchise on course to become my favorite video game series of all time. But this action JRPG from Bandai Namco has gone through numerous changes over the years and seen many peaks and valleys in its quality. One could also look at the series in terms of eras, with the second era beginning at Symphonia and carrying all the way through to Vesperia. The third era would range from Graces to Berseria, and the fourth era begins with today's title, Tales of Arise. Tales of Arise represents the series' fourth major shift in development, and with that shift, of course, there comes concerns whether or not the new ideas in the new engine will be fleshed out enough and stable enough to carry the experience. Though a lot of the Tales of staples have been shed with Arise, as some have been with every era change, Tales of Arise absolutely manages to carry itself. In saying that, however, it is a game that I feel has very few real problems, but still has a lot of room for improvement. It's easily one of the best rounded Tales of games, but doesn't reach the series peak in many areas either, with other titles still holding the mantle of best cast, best story, or best soundtrack. For many players, the sheer fact that it is so well rounded may make this the best Tales of experience to date for them. Tales of Arise is available on most platforms, save for the Switch. Get it for your OUYA! But the footage you're seeing in today's video is from the PlayStation 5 version. Now if you guys like what you see here today, make sure to leave a like, leave a comment, and subscribe to not miss any more JRPG goodness. So given my long-standing relationship with the franchise, the sheer length of time it's been since the last entry, and the fact that this is the 17th mainline entry and the start of a new generation for the series, I feel like we're gonna have a lot to look at in this review today. As such, I've broken the review up into numerous bullet-pointed sections, and I didn't really do much in the way of segueing between them, as I didn't want to bloat this video any more than necessary. And I can tell you, I definitely have a lot to say, and though you will hear a lot of criticism, it comes from a place of love and with hope to see future titles reach even greater heights. There were no shortcomings in this game that I felt really killed my experience, but there's definitely areas I think they can look to make the experience that much better going forward. So welcome ladies and gentlemen to this exhaustive review of Tales of Arise. I know it's a little bit late, so uh, if you can, please give the video a share. Those algorithm gods need to have their thirst satiated somehow. And with that, let's start with what's one of the good but still arguably weaker parts of the game the story. So considering the game as a whole, I will not hesitate to say it is a fantastic experience. However, the story is probably the area where this entry excels the least. That isn't to say it's bad, it's just more adventure driven than story driven. It's still entertaining and engaging through and through, however perhaps just due to what it is and the somewhat repetitive structure it employs, it does often lack a sense of urgency or a feeling of real and present danger. To make this a little more clear, let's start at the beginning. To fully grasp the story, you first have to understand the universe that it takes place in. For this review, we have two planets we need to look at, Dana and Lenigus. Lenigus is inhabited by a race of people known as Renans. The Renans are the dominant power in the universe. From Lenigus, five Renan lords descend upon the nearby planet Dana and mercilessly and swiftly conquer and enslave its people. These Renan lords are in something of a competition with one another to become the Sovereign, and Dana serves as their arena. What this competition is really for and what the duty of the Sovereign is exactly is a mystery. History. And if the answers were once known, they had long been forgotten to the people of Dana. By the time we start our journey, Dana had already been enslaved for generations and has more or less just accepted that this is now the natural way of life. But that's not to say there aren't a few nails that have yet to be hammered down. Enter Alfin. A mysterious man with no memory of his past, unable to feel pain, and an identity hidden by a metal mask permanently fixed to his face. And I know what you're all thinking, but how does he eat? And I promise you, they cover that. So the story isn't written off just yet. And trust me, I know how much that could tear down this whole experience, and let's be honest, it makes all the difference between the game being a 2 or a 10. But moving on. Alfin, perhaps because he doesn't feel pain, has a little more courage than the rest of the slaves in his realm, and he makes a habit of standing up to the guards to 
protect the downtrodden. One day, however, he finds guards in pursuit of a mysterious running girl named Shion. Shion is afflicted with a curse aptly named the Thorns, which causes anybody who touches her to experience severe amounts of pain. As one can imagine, this has made her life something of a sad tale, denying her the basic need for human touch. But you can probably see where this is going already. East meets West, a girl whose touch causes pain and a boy who can't feel any. Sure, it's not the most original premise in the world, but they make it work, and it allows for some endearing romantic tension. After helping Shion escape and establishing a couple new allies, Shion and Alfin take on a new quest to liberate the people of Calaglia, Alfin's hometown, by overthrowing the realm's Renan Lord. And from there, the game takes on a gotta fight them all sort of Pokemon structure. Of course, with this being the plot, the themes of the game should be pretty obvious. Though we do get to see more facets of the overarching issue, what's essentially planetary colonization and enslavement, than a lot of other games might look into. We see the effects of those conscripted to fight for their oppressors, those whose life, livelihood, and home were taken away, those who perhaps don't believe in the cause of the conquerors they share a race with, and also the loss of culture that comes as a result of centuries of oppression. With each chapter focusing on a different part of the overarching systemic problem, Tales of Arise frequently changes the slant of the narrative, ultimately helping the story feel like it's not spinning its wheels quite as much as it is. But then we are, in fact, doing the same thing every chapter until about Act 3. Act 3, I can't show much of due to spoilers and won't really talk much about here, but I will say this. It jumps the shark pretty hard, but in a way that I really enjoy. It's not like it doesn't work with the first two acts or make sense, but man, does it really feel like an entirely different adventure at that point. All in, the main story can probably be beaten in about 44 hours. Though it took me around 67 doing a good chunk of the side quests along the way. At 76 hours, I hit the Platinum, though it could probably be done a bit faster had I planned for it earlier. And just a note on the Platinum as well. Thanks to some of the DLC practices, which we'll talk about more later, some people started spreading the rumor that you can't actually get all the trophies without getting the DLC. This is categorically not true. I do not buy DLC personally, and I didn't for this. I'm not usually one to bother with getting Platinums either, but it wasn't hard to get, and I wanted to provide proof that those rumors were baseless for those who maybe still believed it. Also, now I can clickbait it in the thumbnail or title if I so feel like it. But back on the story. I'll note that it definitely feels like they plucked ideas and events from a lot of older Tales games, mainly Symphonia, A Bit of Abyss, and Some Graces F. The Symphonia aspect is the easiest to address without spoilers. The two planets vying for power, for instance, literal power, as in planetary energy. We've seen that first in Symphonia with Silverant and Tethyala, and here again with Lenigus, Rena, and Dana. Also in Symphonia, we had the slaves in work camps marked with specific types of key crests. Here in Arise, they have stones embedded into the backs of their hands. The Abyss and Grace's F similarities are generally more contained and have shorter reaching ramifications. Certain events just feel like they've been plucked from the games and mirrored here. My only point in addressing this, however, isn't to say that the story is worse off or better because of these things, but merely to state that if you have a long-standing relationship with the series, some of the story beats and events will feel like well-trodden territory. It's not the best story in the series and not an outstanding one for the genre, but there's certainly nothing wrong with it and it is at least consistently engaging. That sounds familiar. You watching Back to the Future? No, it's uh, Tales of Arise. Music just sounds pretty similar. Okay, never mind. The Characters and dialogue. I really enjoyed the entirety of the main cast here, though if I had to pick the weak link, it would be our main character, Alfin. In many ways, Alfin is a very generic protagonist, not actually getting any interesting details until about 30 hours in. He's not a bad character exactly, and he lends well to the party dynamic, but it does feel like you can predict a lot of his dialogue and responses before he says them. But considering that that's the worst thing I can say about the cast, I think we have a lot to be happy with here. In terms of total cast dynamics, Arise handles itself in a unique, but really appreciated way. Rather than feeling like a traveling sex tet, our party feels more like three groups of two. While every character does have a relationship with each other, they have a much stronger relationship with one member than they do with the rest. Obviously, Alfin has Xion, so Kisara has Dohalim, and La has Rinwell. Though Rinwell also has Hoodle, her pet owl, and this game's mascot character. And let me just say, it is so nice that Hoodle is not the least bit annoying. As a silent mascot character, we get to avoid all the obnoxious attention-seeking we've seen from previous characters like Tipo or Bien. 
Genfu. In saying each character has a strong bond with one other character though, it's not like they feel like they're sectioned off members of the group or anything. You will see the party lines crossing frequently as the game unfolds. Law trying to train with Alfin, Xion interrogating Kasara about fishing, food, cooking, and so on. Having them gravitate towards one member more than the others actually feels really organic here and honestly helps the characters feel like they're better written because of it. Though on that note, you might be wondering how the dialogue actually is. Well, while it's not bad, it's not really got exceptional character behind it either. It's certainly a ways off from the near replicants of the world. It all has a very standard kind of anime approach, which is just fine by me. But there was a couple lines here and there that stuck out as really really awful. They're rare, but they are so bad they will leave a long-standing impression and are likely to make you laugh at very inappropriate moments. The worst times I obviously can't show for spoiler reasons, but if any of you are familiar with those bad out-of-context fate memes like people die if they are killed, it's about on par with that. Also, while I loved watching these characters form bonds and romantic interests, and it was a total treat to watch them flirt with the boundaries of their relationships, there were times I wanted to strangle either them or their writers for so frequently not having the confidence to take things just that one step further. That all aside though, I did love the cast and for the curious, my favorite character is Rinwell, probably because she's just so darn cute. Though she's also one of the more underutilized characters when it comes to incorporating her backstory. Her and Kisara. They both have times to shine, but their stories seem to be less relevant in the later portions of the game than other people's are. The most interesting character to me was probably Dohalim. He certainly seems to be one of the more personally conflicted characters and I feel you get a decent look at his backstory and can really feel a through point between who he was and who he is. For better or worse as well, these characters are all generally pretty grounded. If you're looking for an over the top Magilu type character, you won't find one here. There's nobody quite that aloof. Though there are times they get to joke around and be fools in the skits and campfire chats. And it strikes a nice balance of keeping the serious parts serious and the fun parts fun. As contrasting and dissonant as the conflicting tones between story and skits may be. The Combat. Aside from, you know, the entirely new engine, this is probably where Tails has seen its most significant transformation. This in part, I believe, is due to the developers being heavily inspired by Dark Souls while making it. While it doesn't really feel like Dark Souls outside of some story events of people literally going hollow, and it lacks Dark Souls staple jolly cooperation, as in there's no multiplayer in this title, it's not too hard to see how Dark Souls ideas were incorporated into the combat loop. In fact, one might say it's the Dark Souls of Tales. Yeah, let's uh, kill that joke before somebody actually writes an article like that, unironically. So at its core, the combat should seem very familiar, especially to Berseria, which used a similar art gauge as opposed to the old TP meter. You have your standard melee attack combo, which comes at no cost and can be extended as the game progresses. And you have your arts, which use one or two AG, which are these blocks down here on your art gauge. This art gauge can also be extended as the game goes along and recharges rather quickly in between attacks. At the start of the game, you have six art slots, three to use while grounded and three more to use while airborne. Later into the game, you open up a submenu adding three more arts in each category. You also have a dodge button, which when done with perfect timing will execute a perfect dodge, slowing down time and allowing you a chance to counterattack, swiftly closing the gap between you and your enemy. While not exactly a new feature for action games, it fits in really well here and reminds me of one of my favorite older Tales combat mechanics, the chase mechanic from Tales of Hearts R. Where this game has no block mechanic save for one character, this is something you'll want to get very used to very early. The overlimit returns as well, though it's an automated process. Once a character fulfills the requirements, they enter overlimit and are able to use arts at no cost and follow them up with a mystic art, the character's most powerful attack. Further, every character has a unique attack called a boost attack that works on a cooldown. Boost attacks can be called upon from any character at any time provided they are charged and will help to extend your combo time. They also have special abilities depending on who casts them, such as Rinwell's ability to interrupt an enemy's Art, Law's ability to break an enemy's armor, or Kisara's ability to stop an enemy's charge attack. The longer your combo and the lower the enemy's health gauge gets, the quicker you'll charge their boost strike meter as well. Boost strikes, not to be confused with boost attacks, become available when the enemy's boost strike meter is filled and will allow you to call upon one of your party members to perform an instant KO attack. Due to their nature, these often occur when the enemy is already pretty low on HP, but if you build your characters right, you can make them happen much sooner. And I 
highly recommend putting some emphasis on this when buying skills, and you'll see why later. In the world of action RPGs, we've seen a rise in the importance of break gauges, and Tales of Arise is not immune to this. If you target their break gauges, you can open a window of opportunity for massive damage. A lot of people early on were concerned that the lack of enemy stagger animations meant that the combo ability would be hampered, but I can't say that's the case here. Though break gauges are extremely important, perhaps a little too important. So this is the standard set of tools for battle, and it works really well once you get used to the inputs, the speed, and the new dodge-only meta of the game. However, every character in your party plays radically different from each other, more so than any other Tales game. And you can switch between them on the fly while in battle, or switch your non-active party members over to active ones. On the note of characters playing differently, Alfin, for instance, has the Blazing Sword, which allows him to link more art types off his normal art at an exchange to HP, adding typically six more moves to his arsenal. Adding up all of your attacks, the six boost attacks, the six standard attacks, six aerials, and the six blazing sword arts, plus a mystic art, which has two different forms, Alfin will frequently have at least 24 special attacks in his arsenal at any given time, making him one of the most fleshed out, varied, and aggressive fighters in the game. But that doesn't mean he'll be your favorite. Of course, depending on how you control his art loadout, you could end up with less than this, but that's besides the point. Law, on the other hand, while not as art heavy, has a unique gimmick where landing consecutive hits without taking damage will grant him special buffs. When combining this with his sheer speed, he can easily be one of the most powerful fighters in capable hands. Doholim works in a similar fashion to Law, only with a different set of requirements for his buffs. The only character I could say I didn't really like using, and it hurts me to say this about our glorious Cake Knight, was Kisara. Kisara felt rather stunted to me when it came to art loadout and aerial abilities during the period I was using her, and she also lacks a lot of maneuverability options, making it so dodging is not an option. Rather, she can block enemy attacks with her massive shield to gain buffs, and she hits like a hammer. Thing is, the combat seems entirely designed around maneuverability and speed, and Kisara kind of lacks both. This isn't to say that she can't be used well and doesn't get those aerial abilities later, but she felt like she was really at odds to the game's design to me and I personally couldn't quite get into her. Though I do think she'd make an excellent character to pick up on New Game Plus, after filling in her moveset more. She certainly has the capability to be one of the most effective fighters, but with maybe not the steepest learning curve, but the most unorthodox one for the cast. But the remaining crew were a lot of fun to work with. Hell, I even liked using Rinwell in combat, and I don't usually like using casters in these types of games. Enemy designs too, I think are really good, though there isn't a whole lot of variety between them, seeing various reskins time and time again as the game progresses. Plus, this guy here is literally the fucking <laughs> Asylum Demon from Dark Souls. I'm not sure if this was supposed to be a reference or an inside joke, but uh, here he is in all of his shining glory, I guess. But with all that said, there is still something that constantly looms over battle that might push some players out. And even for some of the players that remain, you might find some annoyance in it, regardless. Balance and Difficulty it's a pretty easy claim to make that I found this to be the most difficult Tales of entry since the series made it switch to 3D. And this ramp up in difficulty I think is something we've desperately needed as the past few entries have been quite on the easy and spammy side. But in saying this and acknowledging that I think it took a step in the right direction, I feel like they took certain aspects of balancing this difficulty a step too far. A lot of players voice concerns about CP. CP is the resource used to heal your party and unlock new paths or interact with things in unique ways throughout the world. It is a pretty limited resource pool and the consumables for restoring CP in battle are rather pricey and hard to get. In being honest though, well yes, I did run out of CP here and there, this is not something I would account as a flaw or an issue with the game at all. I actually really like how it's designed and liked the added pressure put on managing the stat. The biggest issue I found was the enemy HP. Thanks to the hyper focus on burst and break gauges, enemy HP pools and defense stats are particularly high and cause them to feel incredibly spongy. It's rare to come across an enemy you can kill in less than 30 to 40 hits, and some enemies, not even special ones, can easily take upwards of 200. The idea, of course, is to target those burst gauges and get one-hit KOs as early as possible, so you only have to deal with about half their total HP pool. But this is easier said than done, and also pigeonholes players into specific build types. Even when chasing certain builds, though, it still runs the risk of making your general attacks feel like you're swinging cheese strings at the enemies that you may be left on the dash of your car on a hot summer's day. Though I adjusted to this, it is something I assume will be a big issue for a lot of players. While some battles with only an enemy or two might be over quickly, the short and frequent battles the older Tales games are known for are a rare thing in Arise. Difficulty can also come in another form, however, albeit at a much lesser rate. Readability. 
Readability in combat is a huge issue in a small handful of the boss battles. I doubt I'm alone in feeling this, but a few certain foes had me spending half my battle spamming life bottles and orange gels trying to avoid game over, while completely lost as to what was even doing damage. Now I would typically succeed in avoiding said game over, but at the cost of a hollow feeling victory and a cluster <laughs> of an experience. But the plus side to all of this? Aside from those really messy boss battles I mentioned, your victories, especially against decent bosses and special boss type enemies, feel properly rewarding, like you really worked for and earned it. Combat feels tighter and more fluid than ever, and even though I wish the general enemies weren't damn near spongy as bosses, I still find this to be a net positive sort of situation. An undeniable step forward, just in need of some more tweaking. Did you learn the Back to the Future theme on guitar? No, it's a Tales of Arise. You know, I, I've been playing it a lot lately, hearing it a lot lately. It's kind of gets stuck in my head a bit, that's all. Oh. Never mind. Progression. Skills, titles, and crafting. So to mitigate some of the challenge along the way, or prevent mitigating it if you so desire, we have a number of progression systems and useful tools at our disposal. The biggest thing is our titles and skills. Titles are, in essence, small groupings of skills. Though the skills need to be unlocked with SP, a resource gained in combat separate from XP or by completing side quests, titles must also be unlocked, usually through much more unusual means. For instance, Kisara has a number of titles that unlock by progressing through the ranks of the fishing minigame. While I like that this validated the minigame a little more and gave me more for my investment in it, I can understand that there are those who do not like this minigame and will not enjoy that it is required to get more out of the combat experience. Some other titles might be unlocked through cooking certain dishes with certain people or completing specific side quests while others unlock naturally as you tackle story events. When you unlock a new title, one new skill is automatically awarded to the character. From there, the choice is yours what skills you unlock from what titles, though unlocking all the skills in a single title will also grant an additional stat increase, such as plus 20 defense or plus 40 penetration, a favorite subgenre of mine. Skills can range anywhere from passive benefits like reduced art casting time to new arts, so on and so forth. They're all pretty standard. Of course, then, we also have crafting. While you can purchase armor sets from various shopkeeps along the way, new weapons and accessories will either have to be found or crafted using gathered materials throughout the game, sometimes using an old piece of gear as a base for the new creation. When it comes to weapons, there's there's nothing to this really, you just have to have the materials and money to do the job, and you do it. Accessory crafting is a tiny bit more complicated, but if you ever played an Atelier game, it won't take long to figure this out. You have a base piece of equipment and a few slots for additional skills. Then you mix and match materials into the equipment, gaining the skills they contain. This system does open up more about two-thirds of the way through the game and allows new ways to spec your characters and even make possibly OP gear, but we're not going to be getting into that for the sake of this review. Cook. Cooking is also a great way to mitigate difficulty and is probably one of the things I think the game improved upon the absolute best. Cooking has always been a bit of a background element in the series, and though you could get a lot out of it, it never felt all too important, and for many entries, I'll be honest, I just ignore the feature entirely and never miss a thing. With Tales of Arise, cooking is handled more like it would be in a Monster Hunter game. Before you leave a campsite or an inn, you can cook a meal with your gathered ingredients. These meals have passive benefits that last a set amount of time usually around 10 to 20 minutes of active play. The benefits range from defense increases, additional EXP or CP gains, better or more frequent enemy drops, and so on. Anytime you do not have an active food buff, feels like time spent losing money, if you know what I mean. Further, different characters specialize in different dishes, and using them to cook said dish can enhance its properties a great deal. For instance, one character may use double the amount of ingredients to extend buff time, or another may decrease the buff time at an increase to its potency. It's not a complicated system, but I have nothing but good feelings towards it now, and I'm happy to see it be a more actively encouraged and valid part of the gameplay loop. In fact, that's probably the absolute biggest thing they change, is just how much they encourage doing it by always putting it in front of your face. And with it hard to ignore like this, it's very easy to make use of. Exploration. Exploration and map design has been considerably ramped up over the past few entries, though depending on what you like in dungeon design, it 
may still feel lacking in some areas. So our maps are either large open areas or rooms connected by hallways. And though there's little in the way of puzzles to actively engage with, they do try to keep things interesting by offering more unique monster spawns, material nodes, chests, fishing spots, campsites, unique traversal elements such as climbing or swimming, as well as a great deal of side quests and alternate paths that offer a decent enough reward to consider exploring them. While anything but unique in their structure, I never found them boring to explore. Though there was one map I absolutely despised, and that would be this specific floor of the castle in Elda Menencia. The problem here isn't exactly the design itself. The problem here is that the main room isn't all that big, and every single door that leads to another rather small room is another loading screen. This sort of thing is kind of fine in dungeons, I guess when your time spent in any room is extended by doing battles, but if you're just exploring, a new load screen every 30 seconds or so is a bit much. But otherwise, I more or less like the maps. I'd love to see puzzles come back in full force like they used to be in the the much, much older games, but this kind of seems to be the direction of the genre these days. I was never bored with the maps, and I think many of them are quite simply just nice to look at. Controls. Hey, game's due in two weeks. You haven't submitted your uh, final controller configuration yet. What's going on? Uh, so I've actually been working on this program. You see, um, it designs the controls for you. All you have to do, you just have to select the controller from the controller bank here, and you just drag it over to one of the alignments on the alignment and does the rest for you. That makes no sense. Why would anybody ever need a controller alignment that's anything less than good? No reason. Just get it done and hand it in, all right? It's due in two weeks. Sure, sure. To say the least, there's issues. You can remap a good deal of the controls, which is great, but being the stubborn person that I am, I left them as is in an attempt to get used to them and hopefully better understand the control philosophy along the way. I never did get too used to it and the philosophy wasn't worth understanding. So change whatever controls you feel you should as early as possible. You won't be missing anything keeping them as is. Otherwise, the responsiveness felt just fine, though I did find myself wishing dodge canceling was a little more forgiving. Side content. Tales of Arise has no shortage of side quests, and on average, I'd say they're of much higher quality than the previous series' efforts. Though if you get right down to the brass tacks of it, the goals are always the same. Kill this, find that, investigate here. But they put in the effort to make it so many of these quests aren't hollow experiences like quest board postings in an MMO, and they usually all have a well-conveyed story to go along with them. Some side quests too will launch into full-on, multi-part side stories you can watch unfold throughout the game. Thankfully too, Arise does not suffer the issue many old old entries did of keeping all of the side quests hidden. You're given an adequate quest log and the world map, which offers a reasonable amount of fast travel, marks areas with side quests in them, indicating where new and completed quests can be exchanged, and also where to go to progress any quest you might have. Arise also introduces Owls and the Ranch. Owls can be found all throughout Dana and are how the party will acquire most of their costume accessories and new color schemes for your typical wear. The Owls' voices are incredibly annoying more often than not, but there's a bit a celebrity cameo fan service behind the mic here too. The ranch is a place where you can raise different animals for the purpose of food and is a pretty simple state of affairs. It's mostly passive, all you have to do is select what animals you want to raise and what type of food to give them, as well as how many cats and dogs will keep watch over the ranch to dispose of critters causing havoc. When the animals are grown, you collect their meat and get the next batch set up. This can all be handled from the various campsites around the game. I mentioned fishing briefly earlier too, and this is a pretty big one, tying into what skills some characters can use, certain skits getting unlocked, what recipes become available, etc. I actually bounced off the fishing pretty hard at first as the progression system for it wasn't all that clear and they do a horrible job teaching you the mechanics, but a quick read through the tutorials menu for it taught me the ropes soon enough. Over time, fishing became one of my favorite pastimes in the game, though I do feel it suffers a little bit from the same thing the main fights do. The fish endurance is a little bit spongy and makes the average catch more time consuming than I'd prefer, but it was a fun time overall. 
Skittles. Skits were a great deal of controversy prior to the game's launch, revealing that they dropped the old talking heads and 2D portraits in favor of semi-static 3D portraits in poses and with lip sync and occasional animation. And while a part of me will always miss the traditional portraits, this Scarlet Nexus-esque approach works really well and arguably breathes more life into the skits than ever before. The quality of most of the skits too I find is really good, jumping between story related, character related, or just good fun. Very few of them feel useless and this is in part thanks to some of the smaller conversations just happening as the characters walk around. One of the better additions we've seen in Tales of Zesteria that I'm happy to see return. But it bears repeating here what I said earlier. There is a strange juxtaposition or a dissonance between the tone of the story and the tone of the skits. But when you consider the alternative options, I think they made the right move. It was either they section off the more fun character moments and charming interactions to skits, insert them directly into the story in an especially jarring way, or avoid having them all together and serve us a really bleak Tales of game. In sectioning it off to be mostly in the skits or in unique locations like the Owl Forest, I think it created enough separation between the two main tones of the game to really work. And much to my pleasure, the skits are not as overbearing as they were in Berseria. Most of them aren't too long and they don't serve absurd amounts of them back to back, even though there are over 300 of them. DLC Implementation so, I never got the DLC myself and can't say too much about it as a result. I can tell you as a have not, the ads at the camp scenes were a bit invasive, and there was something of a feeling of FOMO leering over me. But this isn't too hard for me to ignore, so I was fine without it. However, for those who did get the DLC, they may find the implementation was perhaps a bit poorly handled, at least depending on what you're trying to get out of it. Now, because I can't attest to this myself, I'm going to do something I never really do around here and consult an expert. Expert. So I'd like you all to give a very warm welcome to my dear friend, Gil Valentine, from the cult Resident Evil video game series based off the Hollywood movie series of the same name. Gil? 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 Oh, hey, what's up? Oh, wait, why am I the bouncer? We ain't got time for your life story, okay? Get on with it. Okay, so I would like to preface this section by stating that I intensely enjoyed Tales of Arise and most of what it offered. However, the DLC implementation for the game is definitely something that left a bit of a sour taste, and is something that needs to be addressed. The European Collector's Edition came with a majority of released DLC packs, which included most, if not all, the additional costumes, as well as a plethora of booster items to help you get started on your journey through Dana. Now, it's not necessarily a big deal to include costumes as an extra for a game like this, however, the implementation is somewhat problematic. At least, from my point of view. With the costume packs comes a 300 SP bonus at the bottom which automatically gets added if you hit accept all when getting the costumes themselves. If you're looking for a good time with the story and don't care too much about the unlocking of skills, it's not a bad thing. However, you can unknowingly give yourself a more than modest head start in the game by accepting all packs, leading to a rough 3100 SP to start you off with. To give some context, most early game fights earn you anywhere from 2 to 10 SP per fight, and this persists throughout the rest of the game. I don't think SP economy is the first thing that comes to mind for most people. However, if you're like me and don't want to utilize the boosters in SP, then it can feel a bit like a minefield to accept all the costume pieces individually. Granted, the costumes themselves are beautifully detailed and the already far too handsome cast gets even more thirst inducing with these extra threats of fashion. Highly recommend Dolim's Professor Getup and Gazar's teacher outfit to give the playthrough that extra bit of seasoning if you feel the defaults are too plain. Alongside the costumes, you also unlock a weapon skin for the prototype weapons for each character. The way the game works is that you need to have the weapon to unlock the weapon skin, leaving you with an arsenal of weapons that will likely grant a significant advantage for roughly two-thirds of the game. It wouldn't really be an issue for me if it wasn't for the fact that each costume unlocks a separate title for the characters which in turn unlocks a set of arts. While not being extremely utilizable early game due to their high cost in AG, these arts are devastatingly effective.
exclusive and exclusive to the DLC. Alongside this, you get a significant stat bonus when completing all the skills on the title emblem, with boosts of 50 instead of the early game bonuses of 10. The recipes that are included also give an extreme advantage with the XP and attack boosters, with the DLC also providing all the ingredients needed in rather large quantities. These packs also include shop discounts, EXP boosters, and SP boosters, so if you want a helping hand, this will be at least the least invasive DLC to get, since you can turn most of the effects on or off anyway in the artifacts menu. What I'm getting at is that while any of this is completely optional, it makes something that was meant to feel like a cosmetic change to the characters a rather invasive thing to have in the game. And as Tark said earlier, you're never too far off from being reminded that said DLC is available for purchase at insert your chosen platform here. Luckily, you can turn off any of the above mentioned arts in the arts menu if you're bothered by it. While I'm absolutely in love with Tales of Arise, with its wonderful presentation, gameplay, and story, it does make me wish for the costumes to just be costumes. I love the way they look and Xion definitely got a massive glow up during my playthrough from it. But I can't help but feel that the way the DLC is implemented changes the game too much to really say it's good. Then again... So while the DLC offers a lot to help you in battle and a lot to help you look your best, it is a shame that they're not purely cosmetic as some people may be looking for. More skeptical types may also see the difficulty in the game and the DLC on offer as not entirely unrelated, that perhaps the game was made harder to encourage more sales than the DLC. Though this isn't something I believe, I would not hold it against anybody who did. And let me just say in wrapping up this section, for clarity's sake, I have no problem with DLC made to help those who are struggling. It's their choice to get it if they want. But for those who just want to look good, they should be able to make that choice as well without the extra baggage and without the invasive ads every step of the way. Visuals and performance. Let me start by saying the game in many areas looks gorgeous for a JRPG with an anime aesthetic. The character designs and enemy designs are great and many of the zones look rather lush and well constructed. Skyboxes get a decent amount of attention too and they make a great use of their color palettes to create distinct tonal separation between the realms. Lighting effects and occasional particle effects effortlessly breathe life into the world and a consistent and high frame rate makes it easy to soak it all in. In saying all that though, playing this on PS5 and I guess the same can be said for the PC version, did leave a little bit to be desired. More than anything, it just feels like a port of last gen's pro version consoles. None of the PlayStation 5's unique features have been implemented, nor has the beefier hardware been taken advantage of, with pop-in happening with regularity and load times not being quite up to the new generation's promises. Further, on PC, a distinct lack of ultra-wide support has been a sore oversight, but at least the community there is working to fix that and the pop-in issues. Apparently, there are also ways to soft lock in combat that hopefully is getting worked on, though I never ran into any of them myself. I never ran into any glitches at all for that matter in my 76 hours with the game. So I think this is quite generally a fantastic showing. Animations in combat, exploration, and cutscenes is the best it's ever been, and a few specific moments have full anime style cutscenes lovingly put together by the hardworking artists at Ufotable. While this may not be their best work to date, possibly the result of internal pressures and working conditions over the past year, it is very well done. We Regardless. Look, I have had enough of you and this game. And I didn't want to have to do this, but like, that's it, man. End of the month, you're out. Can't take it anymore. You okay, buddy? Motoi Sakuraba returns once again to fill our delicate ear pussies with his music, and for once, it's quite a bit different than his normal Tales of efforts. You can still hear traditional ideas here and there, but rather than the blazing synths the series has become known for, we have these full and vibrant sounding orchestrated pieces, and I'm really of two minds on them. Though his traditional sound obviously ran its course and got kind of old several games back, they were such a characteristic part of the series that I think I might miss the quality they added to the experience. The score 
scores now remind me a little of Nino Kuni or something, which isn't bad, but it's also not the best thing in my books. On the other hand, it is a fresh and interesting new side to Motoi that this series hasn't really seen much of yet. Now, it's not like this is the first time Motoi's dipped his toes into more orchestral soundscapes, and I don't think it's the best time he's done it either. I think his work on Dark Souls is worthy of a nice shiny pedestal and definitely outclasses what he done here, but the effort is still not a bad one. Maybe a little less exciting, and maybe that one song sounds too much like the main theme from Back to the Future, and sure, maybe some of the themes work really badly as overworld themes and get way too epic when things are way too chill, but for the most part, it hits the right notes. Not to make it a competition or anything, but I'll always find myself wanting to see Goshina return to the series as prominently as they were in Legendia, but that's neither here nor there. Voiceovers. They're fine. Translation. Oh, okay, okay, we'll go back to the voiceovers. Look, when I say they're fine, I mean they're fine. Whether you play dubbed or subbed, you'll more than likely be happy with what you get. If you don't play dubbed and you think all dubs are shit- Shut up! It's none of your concern. There's nobody in the game I think was outright bad besides some of the owl sounds, but even then I amount that to poor voice directing than anything. I can't say the material was a big challenge for the actors either, so it's not like there's anything worthy of some award-winning performance here. But it's all pretty good. Most of the cast is made of familiar voices, and it can be a little distracting trying to pinpoint where you heard them before, but they all do well. They're all tried and true voice actors. I guess if I had one real complaint, it's that... Combat chatter is a little too busy, but that's also becoming very common these days. Other than that, nothing else to report. Translation. The last thing we need to look at today is the translation. It's a little shoddy, or rather the editing in the subtitles is a little shoddy. Since the game was developed for a simultaneous worldwide release, it's worth looking at this as more of a simultaneously developed game than a localization. Every step of the way, East and West were working together to create a cohesive worldwide launch, and they mostly succeeded, though you will definitely see typos here and there. Missed strokes on the keys, extra words inserted or missing in the subtitles, etc. It's not free frequent exactly, but it's frequent enough that you can't miss it. In closing, so ultimately, where do I land with this? I don't know how clear I've made it, but I really did enjoy the game, and it will very likely be one of my favorite games this year. With this being the start of a new era for the Tales of games, I was expecting it to be experiencing some growing pains, and though I listed a great deal of areas I think the series could improve upon, this is definitely one of the strongest starts I've seen to a game series going through a metamorphosis. If all I have to criticize is the room for improvement, and I never really stumbled into anything too broken or horribly lacking, I think we have a lot to look forward to from the Tales of series this generation. Though I do desperately wish to see a return to form in some aspects too. Overworlds, airships, the Wonder Chef, monster lenses, the Sorcerer's Ring, that one really hurts. Cats, turtles, save points, water travel, you know, we've left behind a lot as the years went along. Combat advantage, hitting enemies on the world map, stuff like that. And with this stuff gradually getting phased out, yeah, I do think a lot of the series charm has kind of gone with it. This is probably one of the bleakest and most serious Tales of games, but it still does have a lot of charm, don't get me wrong. With all we've shed though, we've gained a lot as well, and I can't really say that the series is worse off now than it was before. In many ways, it's better off, just maybe not because of those things. It is just that, as a longtime fan, the series kind of felt built off all those things that get shed out over the years, and I would absolutely love to see them come back. But it's a great game regardless, and that's where I'm going to leave it. Another great game in my favorite series, and it holds great promise for the future of the series. And it would please me to no end to see us embrace the future by also embracing the past. I'm sure there's a Back to Future joke in there somewhere, but uh, it's not really coming to me. Anyway, if you guys found this video helpful or useful at all, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you can. Links to all of my socials are in the description below, and as always, folks, thanks for watching. So, once again, thank you all for watching this. I understand this is really late, so if you can, give it a like, give it a share, do your thing. Also, check out Gil on Twitch and YouTube. You can find the links in the description below. Ah, oh, fuck. What's my line?